This is a recording of the panel discussion at the Lightfield Workshop held on June the 7th, 2018 at Adobe San Francisco. The panel was hosted by Podlik Joshi from Adobe and Pete Lude from Mission Rock Digital. Our panelists were Brian Cabral from Facebook, Ryan Dam from Visby Camera, John Carafin from Lightfield Labs, Tador Georgiev from Adobe, David Sump, ASC, and Thomas Burnett from Foby 3D. This panel discussion was brought to you by Adobe Research, Mission Rock Digital, Quantum, the Visual Effects Society Bay Area section, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, San Francisco chapter, and the American Society of Cinematographers. Okay, I'm Dave Stump, ASC. I'm the chairman of the camera committee at the American Society of Cinematographers also the chair of the metadata subcommittee. I'm on the SciTech Council of the Academy. I hold a scientific and technical Oscar, and I'm very interested in light field, and I was the cinematographer on the short film Life for um, um, Lytro that debuted at NAB two years ago. Good. And you want to see more of that based on your experience? Yes, I do. I, I think this is a, an urgently needed technology. And I've been chasing uh, computational and depth sensing cameras for many, many years. You're doing. Yeah, my name is Brian Cabral. Uh, I build cameras at Oculus and Facebook. Um, you might ask why we do such things. Um, building light field and seeing depth reconstruction cameras. Um, the reason we do that is we want to tell stories. We want to tell uh, your stories. And you can only do that with uh, content and cameras. So you start with cameras. I've been building cameras and graphics hardware for 35 years. It probably isn't a pixel I haven't slung once, once or twice. Uh, um, with that said, I think this is technically one of the hardest problems I've ever worked on. Um, and so we have this saying at Facebook that the journey is only 1% done. And there are definitely days when I feel like that's really quite true. Um, but uh, I'm super excited to be part of this because I think it is the future. Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah. Ryan Dam. Uh, my name's Ryan. I'm a kind of a longtime camera hacker. I've been at startups and so on. And I've been interested in light fields actually since Lytro was refocus imaging about 10 years ago. Um, and when VR kind of started to be in the air a bit, I decided we had to do light fields for VR. So I founded a company called Visby, uh, hired a bunch of people who were way smarter than I am, and we've been, we've been hacking on it. We tell our investors we're more than 1% of the way done. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm able to say. Anyway, so I'm John Carafin, CEO for Lightfield Lab, and we are completely dedicated to the vision of taking all of these accessories off the body and being a really able to project the true light field into space. So we are focused on all of the technologies to create true holographic display. Uh, the entire founding team, frankly, everybody at the company right now has a background in light field technologies, obviously kind of all in the same circles here for this kind of obvious reasons. Uh, but we, we, we've been really passionate about the space. Every time we were working with studios as we launched the cinema technologies, we really got the same kinds of questions about when do we enable holographic display so that you can capture all that content, all the rich, dense light field, and not have to rasterize and throw away all the information and result in a two-dimensional. So what we're doing is taking an approach to really make it a real technology, not science fiction. We do have everything that we've been showing, and I'll talk certain on this panel quite a bit about what we're doing. Uh, I'm just honored to be part of this entire committee and this entire group here. I see so many faces that I know, so that's really exciting. Anyway, really excited to uh, tell you a lot. Uh, work with everybody here. Compromise. So my name is Todor Georgiev. Uh, in my previous life, I was a physicist, but now I'm doing computers and imaging and cameras for the, like, I don't know, uh, maybe last 20 years or so. Uh, I've been in Adobe for many years. We tried to establish, uh, well, I did some features for Photoshop, uh, but we tried to establish competition to Lightroom to be uh, equal or better. Um, we failed. Uh, 
why it failed and all this thing. Okay, but but starting out on a good note here, Tor. Right. Uh, so I've, I've been in uh, Qualcomm for a few years, trying to do more real hardware things like optics and physics based and light fields and things, cameras. And now I'm back in Adobe and again working on cameras. But throughout my journey, I try to understand light fields and I've been writing all those papers and people tell me that they understand the paper. Right. Yes, you, they do. <laughs> it's been very helpful. Go to, go to Toto's website and you'll see a lot of excellent information there. Let's start at the beginning, which is arguably cameras. And maybe we could just talk a little bit about what camera architectures make the most sense and what we see in the future. What I mean by that is in the past, we've had cameras that I think we're very familiar with from Raytrix and Lytro that used a large CMOS sensor with a micro lens display, lenslets. And more recently, we've been seeing examples of uh, a camera array, maybe made up of 4K or similar cameras that are synchronized and uh, capturing over a wider distance. Can we talk about the trade-offs and what we think the future is going to hold? Who wants to go first? I can jump in on that. I like, I like cameras. Um, so I think that the early light field cameras that were using micro lens arrays are an example of what I like to call micro light fields. I think it's a really important distinction. Most of the people up here are working in more macroscopic light fields, right? So you're capturing light across a really large area for uh, virtual reality or augmented reality or holographic screens. Um, I think that's really exciting. That's kind of a brand new area. The micro light fields are interesting, I think, more for traditional imaging and traditional displays. Also very interesting, but you're never really going to get to these macroscopic light fields with, you know, micro lens rays and, and sensors, unless you can do meters squared at a time of silicon. So the thing everyone's doing right now are rays of traditional cameras um, as a way of sampling light across a large area. And that's really bad. Uh, Brian, I think Brian can probably back me up on this since he's been assembling arrays. It's a terrible way to sample a light field because you're really aliasing the signal quite bad. You're, you're worried about the light across a large area, but these series of point samples give you data that's really, really hard to deal with. So you have to use complex prior or some sort of external data to make sense of a light field. So I think right now it's a transitional way to capture a light field because it's off the shelf. You can get them relatively inexpensively and then you just made a mess for your software engineers as it turns out. Uh, I think in the future, we're going to see some stuff that's more natively holographic, but I'm probably not allowed to talk about that. Brian, you have opinions? Uh, yes, you use the tools that are <laughs> available to you, right? <laughs> so um, I think a couple of things that, that you, you have to keep in mind is that um, for all of us here who've been dealing with cameras, traditional optics and deep CMOS sensors are just really damn good. And, and you don't want to throw that way so easily. Um, that's why we move more towards a macro approach. But yes, you've shifted it, the problem to software. Now, luckily, software is, is amazingly keeping up in ways, um, largely because of machine learning, uh, not just to throw that term out there, but machine learning comes perfectly adapted to the prob problem of ill-posed inverse problem, where you need strong priors. It's, it's almost designed for that. So um, I think that there's a really good marriage, almost for the first time, uh, for computational softwares, marry what are very traditional pieces of camera art. Uh, so I'm a bit optimistic there, not to say that the problem is in, doesn't remain nasty and hard. So they say the panel doesn't start until someone picks a fight. <laughs> um, so I actually am pessimistic that we just throw ML on the problem and come up with a good solution. Uh, and, and the reason, frankly, is that um, if you don't actually capture the light in the first place, you're probably not going to hallucinate it correctly, right? So if there's glimmers and glints and, and view-dependent effects and you don't have a camera there to at least sample it, probably not going to hallucinate it correctly. Now, you know, you can lose a lot of money by betting on the wrong side of software. So I, I know I'm going out on a limb there, but I think we're going to have to see really dense arrays before uh, the software can take over. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. One of the other tough problems is that with more hardware comes more expense. So even with the cameras that we've been designing, you're in tens of cameras. 
So, and if they're really good cameras, they're tens of thousands of dollars per camera. So you start to do the multiplication, it gets really expensive really fast. So if you even do greater density, that's even going to be more expensive. So there's also a huge tension in cost. So uh, we shall see. Yeah, I mean, I think the other direction that things are getting cheaper in is the cost of good cameras. So we work with cameras that are a couple thousand dollars a piece. So for a hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware, you can start to sample a light field reasonably densely. This might be where we ask David where he thinks it's going, since he's actually a working cinematographer. Yes, David's one of the few that actually makes money with your artistic sense um, shooting with cameras, and you've shot with light field cameras. What do you think? Well, <clears throat> I'm in favor of denser arrays, but I also know firsthand the cost of working with uh, very dense camera arrays because the Lytro camera that we used to make life was... Uh, about 11 feet long and weighed a thousand pounds and was a little bit difficult to move around but the quality of the images and what we were able to do especially in the visual effects realm was very very powerful but um <clears throat> these are all of these problems i think uh, with the exception of camera density are going to be solved by moore's law Camera density, eventually we're going to start bumping up against uh, diffraction and uh, Heisenberg uncertainty, probably. Makes sense, John, you have a comment? So I'm gonna jump in as the uh, officially unbiased <laughs> non-capture company now. Uh, so I'm gonna say I agree with both of you. Uh, is that I wanna get- Take a side, yeah, come on. Punched here. Uh, but I'm gonna help articulate some of the other types of things that are out there to capture because, uh, I mean, obviously CG and synthetic and all that, right? But there are a lot of other ways that you can capture the light field through different sampling methods, different hardware, different scanning. Uh, there's cool things that I see emerging when you get into, uh, think of more light stage type technologies. And when you bring that kind of an approach, we're actually sampling materials rather than sampling the physical RGB or the AL, uh, the actual aperture illumination information is really powerful. So that is some number of years out, but there are a lot of other types of scanning technology that can capture light fields where you don't have to force a lot to hit that curve. So that's just to present some of the other alternative approaches out there. And uh, obviously for holographic display, we love all of the capture technologies. You can love it all, but I'm gonna say something right now. If you're scanning, you're not filming. Those are two totally different things. And it's kind of all nonsense until you put numbers to it. So I'm going to put something else out there. If you only have three or four cameras looking at an individual part of the scene, it's not a light field. It's just not. You're, you're doing something that's involving depth, but it's not a light field. So now I have a, like a fight on each side here. No, no, no. I actually, I, I agree. You need a lot of apertures to do light field. And we'll, we'll keep talking about that when you talk about how many rays you need for a display as well. Uh, but it's... When I say scanning, just to clarify, uh, there are technologies that are actually filming that are direct illumination systems that are doing things that are not in a static like LIDAR type. So just to highlight, those are emerging. Take a look, look on the internet for everybody out there. Uh, happy to dig into those as well. All right. Talking about uh, frames and number of cameras, we started with 12 uh, cameras, 110 years ago, Lippmann. So he, uh, came up with all those ideas of light field and all that. It wasn't light field, the name was different. It was capturing the radiance, or at that time it was called uh, uh, four dimensional intensity of light, uh, X, Y, and the two angles. Uh, and later others keep doing more and more work and then refocus imaging. Uh, they had 16 megapixels. Uh, we had a 39 megapixel codec sensor in Adobe, and I guess all that is not enough. 100 megapixel, I guess, is not enough. Simply, we need to admit there is no way to capture all that we need if we want faithful, honest capture. What we learn now from those displays is that 100 megapixel, maybe gigapixel, is or beyond is what we need to get real full quality. Everything else is trying to cheat or trying to interpolate between sparse views. If you have 10 cameras, 100 cameras, you interpolate. Also those cameras, you cannot put them close enough to get smooth transition from camera to camera. 
even if you get uh, 1000 cameras, they are sparse. Okay, micro lens arrays get as closest to very dense sampling, but current sensors are not enough. So either we have to do it right with huge big sensors or we are interpolating. Well, now there's the hope of um, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning to interpolate. Maybe something will be achieved, but still that's not the truth. When I talk with doctors, they say, no, no, we don't want super resolution because for them, super resolution is trick. It's not the real thing. They want, when they look at the patient, at the image, they want a real image. And my last thing to mention is, there is hope with other things like uh, PET, uh, positron emission tomography, or CAT scan, um, or um, all those things using radon transforms and capturing, still capturing photons, but going into quantum imaging. And there are two new, uh, two new things that no one is talking about. Those limits are broken. The diffraction limit is broken. Now we can get n times better than the diffraction limit with n photon imaging. Uh, the um, shot noise uh, is also broken. We can get n square root of n times better. So applying those things, getting a bigger sensor may be the way to go with light field. Glad we don't have any shy people up here. Do we, yeah. Before we move on to the next topic, you had one more? <laughs> but let me push on this a little bit. I mean, that the, the implication is that you can at some point get dense enough where you can just simply do linear interpolation or ray lookup. But, but that seems very far off, if not impossible, because you can't pack an infinitely dense sensor that is super wide field of view into space. So you always have to do some interpolation. You have to, in fact, infer that what, what amounts to the depth anyway. And it's just a matter Correlated of how much. The depth. Correlated with the depth. Disparity, depth. Um, some variant of it, right? So you, you're back to the same problem. It just doesn't, it, it may be not as bad if the baseline is small, smaller. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a bookmark in there because we're going to have a breakout session to dig in more detail. And one of the things in the breakout session too, that I didn't really hear you talk about as much, is that the high density or the interpolation is one important factor, but how about we talk about six degrees of freedom, but how much freedom do you have? So I think there's an important artistic or use case aspect to how much are you allowing a viewer to move and still be able to see a photographic image, which speaks to a wider array. So uh, all these things are gonna be important. I think I heard we have a ways to go and I heard don't bet against software, but. Now displays are another really important part here. And I think there's been a lot of interest in displays. I don't think Lippmann had a solution for that a hundred years ago, did he? No. <laughs> 12, cameras. <laughs> 12 cameras, but the view, that's right. They, they had to serve for both. Um, and, and so uh, I'm kind of curious. There's a couple of folks that have been looking, uh, talking about commercializing very practical, realistic light field displays that have some limitations in terms of field of view and whatnot, but could be very effective. Um, I wonder what's changed in the last few years that makes light field displays possible when they weren't 10 years ago, and when do we think we're going to see them into the market? Anybody have opinions about that, John? I have no opinion. Uh, well, uh, first, we have uh, Thomas over here with uh, Foby 3D. So I highly recommend you go check out his display. He has it here with him. It is really exciting that he brought it. Uh, and we love to advocate for any company that is doing real holograms, not the other stuff. So um, just to kind of talk about what has changed, let's talk about what is out there that is often perceived as a hologram in the media, but isn't holographic. So in order to be a hologram, you have to pass a number of tests, meaning you have to actually recreate the physics of light. It can't be something two-dimensional, can't be a volumetric display, which is very different than true holographic. So true holographic is what you see in science fiction movies, right? The things that you think of when you talk about a real object being projected, but if you can't actually focus your eye on the verging rays of light, you don't have a hologram. So that is a very easy test. Take a piece of ground glass, slide it through your image. You actually see the, uh, the exterior of your object. You have a hologram. If you don't have that, then you have some other type of display that's just emitting light. So 
anything that is autostereoscopic, anything that is uh, a one D array of images, anything that is putting glasses on, anything that's head mounted for the most part. Uh, those are all either stereoscopic or autostereoscopic technologies. That is what's often perceived as a hologram, or at least marketed as such. But it is a remarkable difference when you see a real hologram. When you look at it and you can no longer distinguish that there's a digital projection, it's actually a real verging object, which is yeah, very cool. So uh, go ahead. I was hoping I could help you abuse some terminology here. Yeah, please abuse. Yeah. Since, I mean, we use the term holographic a lot. Um, I would, I would actually, as a minor point, say that we at Visby actually consider sixed off headsets functionally holographic. And any holographer is already going to be freaking out, right? We're not doing uh, actual holography, right? We, we're abusing the term holographic, right? If I can call that a motion induced light field. Sure, okay, right. So what it is is you're drawing 2D trajectories of a light field, right? So it's. But the, the display itself, just to decouple. The display is only doing two views, so we always like right. to make sure that's right. Yeah, so the stuff John's working on and Thomas is working on, a lot of the displays that are coming to market that are holographic panels are really interesting because they're drawing this full raster of light rays. But in terms of content, if you're a content creator, you need to create a holographic image if you want to drive a six-off VR headset. So from a content perspective, uh, these new headsets, these new headsets require holographic content. These displays are more holographic, though, in the sense that they're actually drawing the full light field. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's all create holographic content. Totally the controversy. I saw press releases recently from a company named Red about <laughs> a mobile phone device that they say has a light field holographic display. The world's first. They the world's say. first that has four zones. And I don't quite understand how that fits your definition there. So um, I think I want to go back to your definition uh, because then he can get all the tomatoes thrown at him. Uh, so uh, tell me again, remind me, wh what does it take to be a light field image? So I'm actually going to quote someone who's not on the panel right now. Paul DeBevac, a couple of years ago, was uh, was speaking to BES, and uh, someone else had used the term light field in some marketing copy, and he objected and said, if I hold up a, a, a light meter, I'm sampling a light field, aren't I? Right. So in a sense, if we're going to abuse terminology as badly as Red has chosen to, then yeah, anything's a light field. My phone's already a light field display. It's drawing a 4D raster, just two of the dimensions are completely redundant. By the way, I was at the SID Display Week conference um, last week, and when Red was doing their presentation, Paul DeBevic stood up and asked that very question. Now, let me just understand this correctly. Now, maybe actually, since they're not here, let me try to try to back them up a little bit here. If you can draw distinct enough viewports that you can deliver a different image to each eye, you can basically be like one of these six off VR headsets. If you can do eye tracking, figure out where the eyes are, dynamically update the image so you're delivering a holographic experience to a user, I will permit that to be a holographic display. But it's not holographic in the sense of what John and Tom is working on. I don't know if that's what the red camera does there, the red phone does though. So, so I can go into that because it, what, what Red's doing, it's a, by another company called Leia 3D. They're another Silicon Valley company. Um, and David, who was presenting at uh, Display Week, I mean, it, it's cool technology. So we always like to advocate for everybody in the space, but we like to make it very clear it is not a hologram, not even close. Because four views does not make even, well, frankly, it's autostereoscopic. You're getting the left eye and you're getting the right eye. It's an extended view box. It's a really cool, very innovative implementation using a diffractive backlight. So you use the LCD panel. You can then create those one, two, three, four views. You can then move within that eye box. So it looks good when you're in the right position. It's auto stereoscopic and it's got a very nice clean image. But if you want to create something that is actually generating a verging cone of light, those actual holographic bundles, you can't do it with four views. And you can't, you can't frankly do it with anything that they're proposing. So, um, it's really important not to really hurt our entire industry to misuse these terms. So we like to really reclaim the word hologram and use it in the true physics domain, the real sense. And then somebody out there is going to say, what about lasers? Uh, so just to help clarify some of these things. So a hologram is referring to the physical encoding or playback of the light field. A laser hologram is a technique. Right, so you can do that by encoding with reflection holograms. You can do it with transmission holograms. Lots of cool things. We have a whole bunch back at our lab, uh, but that is not defining what is a hologram. An actual hologram, again, is all the things, all the content that everybody here is producing. The types of things that Thomas and some of the other companies in the space are producing. But you can count on one hand the number of display companies out there that are doing real holograms. So then the bigger question goes into, well, why does it matter who really 
cares, as some of you might be thinking that. And what it really comes down to for us is what do we really think is the absolute pinnacle of what a display should be able to achieve? And it should be able to recreate all of the world around us. That's why we have color, that's why we have high dynamic range, that's why we have high frame rates. Everything we do in this entire industry is all about making sure the display is recreating reality as much as we can, but it shouldn't be in that limited frame. So all the content that's being generated, all the algorithms, all the work that's being done in order to regenerate all these multiple viewpoints to reconstruct the physics of light is so key and critical as all of these display technologies evolve. So I'm going to get back to a point that you had just made or asked about why is it now coming up? And uh, so that's my full circle way of getting back to Pete's question. Uh, <laughs> slight little detour. Um, you're seeing a huge resurgence of interest in this. And you kind of see these things going up and down in these peaks. And you see with auto stereoscopic, and then you saw stereoscopic, and rise, and phone, and VR, and air, all things going on. But every decade, you can actually track a, uh, a trend line of these types of technologies coming back up into FAD. Uh, in order to create these immersive or VR or some kind of an experience where you're going into that world. Um, and every generation of the technology gets less and less clunky. I mean, that's just really what, you know, my favorites, the, uh, the Nintendo, what was it, VR Boy or whatever it was, one of my favorites. Uh, so the reason that today things are starting to converge is the same reason that you see both in the display environment as well as in the capture environment, that silicon is starting to reach a fundamental density that you're able to do these types of things that are really crazy and transformational. And it's not as easy as saying that as everybody here just very well uh, articulated. You have to have some really serious innovation in order to do the things for capture and do the things for display to make it really capture a hologram. So these are the big innovations. It's really all about mass production, about silicon, about the technologies of the underlying fundamental ways that you capture or project photons is starting to catch up with what a real hologram requires. And I wanted to, to mention that we have um, another <laughs> expert on the field of um, uh, light field displays. Thomas, would you mind coming up here and explaining <laughs> a bit about what we're doing? I mentioned um, Thomas because uh, he's the uh, head <laughs> of um, uh, Fovi 3D, and he has a um, prototype display here, development kit, that he'd be able to show you. And you probably have some opinions about what's making this possible now, too. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so I've been working on light field display technology for about 15 years. I was a part of a DARPA project at Zebra Imaging about uh, 12 years ago. where We made a, a very large format light field display. It was about a meter in diagonal and had uh, some 600, 800, 1080p projectors in it. So it was quite a, a big deal. The, uh, the display I brought here is our most recent uh, prototype. It is a 20 micro OLED display. It's a 107 megapixel display and can produce a 3D aerial image about four inches of depth. Um, what makes it possible is pixel density um, and the ability to make finer uh, and finer uh, optics. So it has a very complex micro lens array on top of it that frankly, uh, 10 years ago at Zebra, we, we could not have made this. And so um, there are fundamental challenges in uh, computation, photonics, and, uh, uh, and optics. And, and it just seems that recently, uh, um, enough of those technologies evolved to create sort of a next generation prototype. And so this is, uh, will be our last display. And I'm sure John's got some ideas on how to make something as well. So can I, can I pull you guys? How many pixels do you need before it's really a holographic display? What specs do you want? No, it, it, actually, you had to answer the, there's a uh, three fundamental questions is what's your field of view, right? Uh, how far do you want to project off of your surface? And what is the area or what is the visual acuity that you need to achieve? And all those things add up to many gigapixels, right? So it's not as simple, it's a little bit like a capture question, right? That it, you have to know what is the volume that you're capturing, what is the uh, resolution that you're displaying back, what is the type of performance that you're looking for. Uh, but it's pretty easy to think of things in terms of uh, when we do our metrics, we talk about cost per gigapixel, which is kind of fun, right? That's just stupid, uh, but it, we're not even thinking megapixels and that's everything that we're building right now. So it's, it's really a matter of answering what are the product specifications and then you can very easily calculate everything else. So it's fair to say two to three orders of magnitude larger than a 2D display. If not higher. That's a lot of pixels. So uh, my answer here, if it is not gigapixel, just forget it, the toy, especially, especially 
especially for display. Okay. Uh, so what I observed recently, like last couple of years, displays are getting bigger and bigger and approaching one gigapixel. And um, that's that's very that's very good. Uh, which displays? I, I looked on the web, but um, mm, real eyes, real eye, or something like that. But we need to move towards petapixels now. Uh, so in the old times, there was human eyes, well, Pedic and others, and now I remember the name very real eyes. Um, they have more than a gigapixel display. I think it's like four gigapixel or two depending on which version so it no no but uh, uh back of the envelope calculations suggest that that's the range where things become real and before that everything is a toy and that explains why all those 3d stereo displays and all these things did not really take over but we might have a marketing problem if consumers see some of these displays and say oh yeah i saw a holographic display last week and i wasn't that impressed that could be a problem yeah that, actually that's one of the biggest things that we see as a challenge i'm sure you get that as well that, that it, it's not a technology well it's a technology challenge don't get me wrong uh but it's really a matter of the market everybody's pointing i'm not sure okay. everybody see oh david i actually have something to say about this uh Please. I, I don't think it's a marketing issue. I think it's really a standards issue because uh, in order in order to settle the, the questions of how many pixels you really need, you have to start by defining the terms and then setting some standards. So I don't believe it's a marketing problem. I think it's a, a linguistics problem. So I, I agree that there is a huge component, and that's why we love the work over at Cable Labs and a number of the other companies in the space, to make sure that we very well define what is that format moving forward, how do you define, how you get all that dense information. But the bigger thing for at least our viewpoint of the world is that there is no one raster format that can ever work, ever, ever, ever. And it's because you need to make sure you have something that is agnostic to what is your field of view, what is your projection disk, all the things that are going to be part of that display ecosystem that has to transfer between everything. So if you try to then create a standard that is just a raster 4D image or some kind of a 2D representation, it can never work. It's almost like you need people to build parametric light field codecs or something. Yeah, you, uh, you know, that would yeah, be convenient, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, here's a $20. What an idea. I think the question was about what, what the projection technology was for plays at Zebra is what I was gathering. Yeah, so so uh, I was a computation at architect uh, at Zebra Imaging for a number of years. I started in 2003 and I worked on both the static holograms that we made at Zebra as well as the dynamic system we made at DARPA. And they both fundamentally worked the same way in that we synthetically rendered the radiance image from a 3D model, basically for the reason that John's saying is, is once you capture the radiance image as a defined view projection or capture di uh, uh, direction and view uh, projection direction, so it has built in occlusions. So you can't just resample and move around the radiance image. So we, we take geometry into our systems. This display takes geometry into the system. We render the synthetic radiance image and we project it through a micro lens array. So essentially, it's the inverse of the panoptic camera, it's a panoptic projection system. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, this, this brings up actually a different issue entirely, um, which maybe for the content creators in the room, this is of relevance, which is uh, if the fundamental unit of a light field is actually geometry, it's not really a light field anymore. It's, it's volumetric. And the distinction for me absolutely is that uh, volumetric models look like video games because that's fundamentally what that tech is. If all you have is geometry, then all of your rendered views are gonna be no better than a video game. And there's certain kinds of scene geometry that don't really work. Like what's the, what's the polygon representation of a cloud of smoke, right? How do you pick up on light as it moves through a scene? And, and these are kind of trivial edge cases, right? The reason the human face looks weird in a video game or looks good in a 2D movie is that it's capturing the light as it passes through someone's face and does all these subtle things that our brains really pick up on. So geometry, Certainly part of the solution somewhere in the stack. There's got to be a lot more than that, though, for us to, to actually have an end-to-end -end light field solution. Go ahead. One, one, one small, uh, small point. 
when you say geometry, you mean 2D geometry, geometry of the surface of a face or surface of something. But uh, real light field is again geometry, only it is 4D geometry in ray space, in 4D ray space. It's a special kind of. Sure, yeah. And if you had, a, if you had a, an unaliased light field raster, right, if you actually had it truly fully sampled, then the distinctions totally are totally moot, right? A, fully, a full raster is fine. The problem is the capture regime is necessarily massively aliased. So the function of geometry is to allow you to interpolate correctly, because you do a naive, a naive interpolation, you end up getting all sorts of weird edge doubling and so on. So you know the, the state of the art as of 20 years ago, um, I think with the Lugograph papers was to do you know ge scene geometry as a prior to help you with the interpolation kernel. The problem is that's still only as expressive as a game engine, so you need to be more sophisticated than that. Uh, one little point again about the question. Um, so where are those gigapixels in the zebra type of display? Yes, it is gigapixels, but it is static, it is frozen. If you want to have a display, then it's a different story, right? Yeah. Ours is moving. OK, go ahead. <laughs> Ours moves too. So the, the thing is, is you have to be able to render the synthetic radiance image at a frame rate that's conducive to the application. Now, here's the thing is, it's not every application needs 30 frames a second. So for instance, if you're hooking this thing up to an MRI and you scan the patient once, you can just render the synthetic radiance image once from that, from that data and, and project it. And then you can move the human observer around. But if you want to play a video game, then you are going to be rendering the scene at 30 to 60 frames a second. That's radiance image rendering uh, the, the frame, which is a significant computational challenge. But the thing is, is that we do render the pixels as close to the display as possible, and we throw them away. So we do take a streaming scene and render as close to the, the photonics as possible. We don't store any of the pixels. We don't compress them. We don't transport them. We don't uncompress them. And so in that way, the, the synthetic light field image only exists for that one moment in time, and then it's gone. We throw it away. And, and actually, that's a great segue, because I wanted to move along related to that, to the idea of um, interchange, or I got a camera and I got a display, and naively, I've talked to some people that envision this big bundle of HDMI cables somehow that will connect all those light rays to a display, but I don't think that's going to be very practical. And in effect, when we talk about light field displays, I think that we are implying that there's a good deal of computational power and rendering that's married into the display. And that renderer, or whatever you call it, would need to get some format of image into this. So I'm yeah. curious about opinions about that interchange. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, not only do you have to move the data around, you have to do something with it in terms of, of post-production and workflow. So one of the challenges, too, and the tension between 2D geometry, <laughs> manifolds and free space, and, and 4D, is what do you, how do you edit them? How do you create with them? How do you move? Not only once you do that, how do you move them around? And how do you store intermediate results? For instance, how do I drop a, 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 a silver ball, you know, a, a shiny ball, DG generate into the light field, edit it, move it around, move it back out, have all, all the reflections happen, right? How does that work? And what does that workflow look like? And how do we exchange data? So step one, get a room full of PhDs, right? I'm not sure what step two is. <laughs> I mean, these are real big challenges. Well, and I think you raised, uh, there's several in there. One is my post-production pipeline where I'm combining perhaps computer generated and photographically captured images. We have different geometries potentially and, and complications, and I have to workflow those through for my content creation. But when I'm done and I want to publish it as a final light field program, what do I publish it into and how do I get it out of my edit suite to home? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, so that's, you're now you're talking about distribution formats. And the answer there is, I don't think there's an answer yet. We at Visby have an idea for what the answer might look like. And maybe more importantly, we have strong priors about what it won't look like. Um, but that's still very much a, an open question. Don't necessarily pay attention to all the publications coming out of standards bodies yes i think there's a lot of work being done to take existing standards and try to adapt them to these problem spaces and i think more work needs to be done before we're going to get a functional distribution standard mezzanine standards different thing trying to think of how to follow that up uh, so uh, i think that's also partially a reference to some of the things that uh, we have been 
talking about, right? And, uh, you know, we've shown in encoding decoding architecture, we're working on a lot of the standards bodies and a lot of the great work that's coming out of the, uh, the cable industry. And there is a clear path of having different containerized formats that allow you to then bake in whatever the underlying data needs to be. But there is no one singular format that will work between the visual effects world, the professional industry, and then going into the home. But if you don't have a viable path to get this from wherever your Netflix, your ABC, NBC, Fox, I don't know, leaving people out. But how do you get that into a set-top box? How do you get that onto the cable network? How do you get that onto your mobile phones? And make sure that it's agnostic enough that the display is doing all the heavy lifting from that format and then creating whatever is the right view. Because every single display, and as you guys know, obviously, it's independently calibrated. Every single one, doesn't matter if it's 2D, doesn't matter if it's stereoscopic, there's always some kind of a calibration plan. Good God, it gets really a lot of calibration stuff that happens when you get into the holographic domain. Uh, so it's really important that we make sure that even if we don't standardize to your point that we work towards those standards and really articulate very clearly that it is not a two-dimensional standard. That's what's really integral. It just needs to be across the board. Let's put in specifics here. We're not going to be carrying around full rasters as a distribution format. Okay. I mean, it's petabytes per frame ain't going to happen. I don't care how much you compress, it's not going to work. Uh, furthermore, displays are going to have different pixel densities and fields of view. So it has to be a parametric model. The current state of the art is to run it in a game engine. That's the only thing that works. If you want to go generate a thousand views of something, it's pretty much got to be a real-time game engine, and you got to have a big, thick bundle of HDMI cables going back and a whole bunch of big, high-end GPUs to run a thousand instances of Fortnite or something, whatever you're doing. Um, what needs to be built in place of that is something that looks a little bit more like today's video standards, right? You've got some sort of mathematical basis function that lets you calculate what's going on. Maybe it's got geometry in it, maybe it doesn't. But you need to be able to push some data down to a part of the display and let it decode those pixels on the fly. And that's going to be what the distribution format probably looks like. Now, if you look at the existing formats that are out there, none of them exactly do that yet. And then that's an area of active research. So I don't know if I can speak to some of the other work, but uh, Pete, can you speak to anything about uh, any of the container formats? Well, I'm familiar with some, like there's one called Orbix that comes out of Otoy, which is a container format that allows you to take uh, volumetric models like Alembic and textures and color gradations from open EXR and other common techniques and package them in a way that creates a relationship and, a, and an overall bundle. And uh, there's some thinking that that might be in the direction that we need to be going in terms of having a interchange format that really accommodates all flavors. I think we need more math. We need more math. Still need more math before we're gonna get the, the right answer. That's a good start though. And, and, and the only way we're going to get it fast enough um, and low enough power is to put it in hardware, yeah. which means you actually have to get down to the representation, the wavelets or whatever your favorite representation across the, the space, be it geometry or light fields or whatever. You're going to have to figure out how to encode that as a first class representation and then be able to just code that in a stream in hardware. Or, we, or it's going to be hard to see how we're going to be cheap enough to get it in anybody's hand, especially on the display side, whether the display is head mounted or wall. I wanted to bring David back into the conversation here because there's one aspect we haven't really talked about. Um, David, when you shot Life with Lytro, you were using a light field camera then rendering out into a regular display device, a planar device. And I think there is creative decisions being made about the depth of field, the rack focus, the stereo base, if that's appropriate. Um, there's a question there that I hear from the creative community. If I create an image in which I could refocus it later, doesn't that kind of steal all the thunder from the cameraman or the cinematographer? What do you think about what we need to do in order to lock in some of those creative ideas and what do you think about displaying a light field image on a light field display in which the viewer decides where to focus their eyes? Well, I have a feeling that I know how far away direct display from uh, a light field camera into a display is. Uh, and that's a lot of PhDs in the room. Um, <clears throat> but I think we have to stop selling um, the ability to refocus an image as the principal value of light field images, because 
uh, it goes way beyond that, uh, especially for filmmaking. Uh, to me, the bigger principal value of light field imaging in filmmaking is the ability to derive Z depth uh, on a pixel to pixel basis and do visual effects that haven't been thought of or done before. What happens in filmmaking is that you, in order to succeed, we try to put images up and sequences up and, and effects up that the audience has never seen before. And being able to derive Z depth on, on images from a camera is such an amazingly novel idea to the filmic community that it's going to take probably a number of years after filmmakers have seen it to assimilate it and make it their own and dream up the kinds of effects that we can do with it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that the ASC Planoptic Imaging Committee is considering, many of you may be familiar with what's called the CDL or color decision list, in which the onset cinematographer and director could inform what color gamut they intended to use uh, based on metadata. So you're still able to regrade it, but at least you have a starting point. And the concept of a planoptic decision list has arisen, in which case the, uh, the DP would be selecting where their intended focal points and their intended um, depth of field was, along with uh, the Z space that's naturally being created. And that's preserved in metadata, it can be altered in post, but it doesn't need to. And if I can just a uh, little shout out to all the Lytro team here. That, that actually is how we, we capture what David was to make sure that we had, uh, we still had um, focus pullers that were on set and they would do everything in a digital simulation that they would be able to see live on set that was stored as metadata. And then that's the first creative thing that you would see when you loaded up the software. And so uh, I 100% I agree that that's the right approach with the caveat of being able to make sure you don't have that anxiety of did you nail focus or not, right? So, uh, so where is that 2,000 pound Lytro cinema camera? No. I, I use it as my bed. No, I, so just kidding. So just kidding. It's not available for rent on the commercial product Claremont or anything. Uh, I have taken off that hat. I, uh, you would have to, well, actually, I don't know who you're talking about. Who are you talking to? Google? Google. Yeah. Talk to Google. A, a good question. Are we looking at full immersion where I have a degree of motion to look around, or am I looking just at one narrow field of view? We don't have enough cameras, that's why. No. Um, I think there's two philosophies around this, and Brian, you can probably speak to this as well. One is the, the Lytra model, which we mimic right now, which is you build a panel of cameras, uh, and if you want to do something immersive, you either do it in multiple takes, you know, outward facing, or you have multiple panels, right? So you get, you know, now you're talking 500 cameras instead of 100. Uh, that's, uh, that's one way to do it, and I think the ball of cameras is another way. Yeah, so the, the other way is to mimic what would happen if you looked around, which means you take an array spherically, so you have a spherical array. Um, these all have limitations. Uh, the spherical array um, has this notion of a head. So all of these have a head. But, you know, the amount you can move your head around, um, and you make trade-offs. Uh, if you want to look clear around, you're going to have some other uh, challenges, because now all your rays are diverging, and you have more occlusion headaches. Uh, so you give it with one hand and take it away with the other. I think time, these, te these technologies will fuse, meaning you'll have arrays of camera spheres or some such thing. Interesting. Uh, so I actually think what we're going to see is similar to the 360 market where you're going to have these, or maybe the 2D market, right? You've got cameras that have integrated lenses and you're not making a choice about certain elements of the image. You set up and shoot and what you get is dictated by your hardware. And that's kind of the state of play right now with 360 cameras that come from a vendor, right? The, the image is more or less dictated by the way they've arranged the cameras and that's it. And with a light field ball of cameras, you are getting off the shelf a choice around the amount of space someone can navigate around or the field of view it's, it's able to cover. The other direction to go is custom, right? So you assemble an array of cameras based on the project, you orient them in the way you want. Maybe it's outward facing for an immersive shot on location. Maybe it's inward facing for performance capture for later dropping into a CG environment. Um, that's what my company's thinking about is how do we make these flexible so that uh, high-end producers can build the arrays they want or, or work around their creative prompt. I think there's going to be a lot of action also on the 
uh, fully calibrated, fully built, all in one solution as well. I think I'm hearing that we should invest in camera companies and CMOS sensor companies because there's going to be a lot of them, a lot of camera pixels out there. Uh, I think the camera is the new pixels, the way we talk about it, right? The question is, when are we going to see holographic displays ready for consumers and what needs to happen to get from here to there? Yeah, so he's got one for sale right there. Um, I, I, uh, I Don't forget, we're uh, being recorded here, right? So, yeah. we, uh, we are making these things for sale. So if you guys want one, come see me. Uh, it is $141,000 for a 6 by 6 inch by 9 inch box. You only got okay. two, right? I built three. Of them. <laughs> what about the computer? <laughs> the computer, computer. Three. You can supply your own computer. Uh, luckily, our our software scales pretty well. So, yeah, so uh, and I think was David saying something? You want to buy one, David? Uh, I was wondering if it's cheaper to buy three. <laughs> is there a volume discount? Uh, so, uh, yes, there is. Yeah, both both discounts. Um, I, I, you know, when it. It pays to define when you say when will it be available because to Thomas's point, you, there are light field type displays that you could go out and buy. Uh, when you're looking at it, if you're asking when will you see it in Best Buy or in a big box store, that's a very different question, right? And then the thing that we 100% believe and support and all the, the different partnerships that we have in this room alone is really a matter of making sure we have at least thousands of hours, 5,000 hours is our goal of compelling holographic content. And that doesn't mean necessarily a physical image. It can be the different gaming, the different uh, operating system things, the different, just enough content that you have a sufficient killer app that people are justified to purchase that kind of a technology. And if you launch too fast, too quick, and I think you've seen this in some of the other types of immersive display technologies, if you do that in mass production, it will kill that market really quickly because people have a very bad experience. There's no real compelling reason. So in terms of your specific question of when can you buy one, um, how much money do you have on you? Because we're more than, no, I'm just kidding. So just kidding. But the, uh, the real easy answer is in the next number of years, you're going to see these become much more readily accessible, especially when you're talking about large venues. Uh, I've been trying to say something yeah, sorry, for, for some time. Uh, you're so uh, shy. Partially because it's kind of simple and obvious, but maybe it needs to be addressed anyway. Basically, radiance, uh, light, is very redundant. Okay, uh, everyone knows Lambertian surface. If a light ray hits one point, it spreads in all directions uh, equally. Okay, so because of that, there is this redundancy that we need to address. And because we are suffering from insufficient um amount of space uh, megapixels gigapixels okay we are happy to do that so all the tricks in this light field business are in how to compress the light field and what to do about compression and then when you talk about standards for um okay if it is not just a raw light field is um, we want to have a standard standard includes the compression and the compression includes little dirty tricks from those um, computer scientists who have invented some, some method. So, um, by the way, the light field is four dimensional, but for all practical purposes, almost always, it is three dimensional. There is a mathematical theorem, okay, there is some equations which show that it is. Okay, with very small assumptions, very little assumptions. Isn't that with the Lambertian assumption, Totter? No, no, it's not no? Lambertian. Mm -hmm. It's um, uh, so the question is about uh, things like light field microscopy when the object is fully transparent. When you're capturing something like um, CAT scan or PET scan or uh, light field microscope, okay, uh, there is uh, still this three-dimensional. Uh, I think Ren was calling it uh, dimensionality gap. So there's two dimensional images, uh, three, but uh, somehow four is not, not needed. Okay, so all these things need to be addressed when you do compression or when you do backwards rendering of the image. But unfortunately, in the final display, you need to do 
all the 4G. Um, so, so my thoughts on the on the radiance image is a, is a kind of a carrier format is is that there are novel display technologies that are available today, such as multi depth plane displays, either near eye or even stuff stuff like you see from light space or looking glass, which are a fairly nice displays. But you wouldn't want to take a radiance image and sample that for the multi depth planes because the closer you move to or close farther away you know from the the uh, captured plane the more blur would be induced in a display like that whereas if you took geometry and rendered all the planes from geometry then that blur would not be uh, introduced into that display technology artificially so to speak so um even though i am very good at rendering radiance images i just don't see them as going forward as a, as a carrier format or a, a display agnostic environment and the other thing is is a lot of these light bulb displays are really good for multi-view, multi-viewers, multi-view tasks. You know, where you get a large number of people who are collaborating over a uh, a scene, so you can't really capture the data from a singular point of view to your to your point of view. And it doesn't matter if it's a ball of cameras. You actually need to reproject the scene from all sorts of different uh, uh, from uh, view, viewports, I guess, viewpoints to actually project a full volume of light. So I, um, I don't know what our question was anymore, but I'm going to respond to this. Uh, so uh, two points that were just made here that one thing that I, I firmly believe from a lot of experience in the space, and I think I saw you react to a little bit, that reflections, refractions, transparencies, specular highlights, all the things that make the real world real are really difficult to compress, right? Lambertian assumption, fantastic, right? That compresses very well. It's a nice 3D representation, just like you said. But when you really want to see things where you get the glint in the eye and you get the things that are truly unique about when we're looking at the real world, that from experience doesn't compress. Uh, but the question is, do you really need that? And that's a, that's a totally separate, separate question. But we like to differentiate between a volumetric data set and a true holographic or light field data set and are very, 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 very different because one has, it's almost like you just have a projection mapped surface and it's all inversion, it's uniform, it's a 2D effective pixel from no matter what view angle you're at, which again, separate from how you would capture that. Uh, but if you compare that directly to something that is a physically based ray trace of that same image, it is dramatically different. So it's, uh, I think it's important to distinguish that there's a, a, a huge variance between radiance image, light field image, holographic image, volumetric image. There's lots of different types of images, which again, to the point of standardization, you know, everybody's confused. Uh, but I just wanna be really clear that a true holographic image has all of that physics and doesn't compress it out. And, just leave a residual 2D or 3D. So we should put a, I'm hearing a couple of interesting things. One is we have a lot more to learn about representation, and I can't wait to see some actual images reproduced using some of these different modalities so we can get a feeling as to what the um, artifacts might be. And, and, and secondly, when we talked, we started this question about commercial adoption, and I'm thinking of a likely scenario is that there are some niche industrial or B2B type applications, whether they're um, uh, scientific uh, explorations or medical, or it could be theme parks where it's a B2B under a controlled circumstance. We're likely, I think, to see light field technology applied there before, long before it gets to the home. But, uh, we haven't talked about post-production too much, and I think we have a lot of people in the room that are quite familiar and probably curious about that. Do we think that um, doing post-production in light field uh, ecosystem is it more like a game engine or is it more like a nonlinear editor? Is it something in between opinions? Uh, I can tell you right now, light field post-production is having engineers write code and then you get an image out the other side. So it's pretty wide open. Uh, but, but, but seriously, I think it's, it's gonna have to have some element of E. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the, the, the big challenges. Implied in the question about uh, home availability is really conquering the two-sided market of content and display meaning you have to have enough content for displays to take off. That happened with HD as well. It, and 3D. And so if you don't, you have to solve both simultaneously. And right in the middle of that is post-production work. Because that's how you create the content. That's how you edit it. It's how you, know, you, you tell stories. 
And we have a lot of work to do there. And, and, and it's a huge, huge challenge because our current workflow is very geometric based. This is one of the first times that everybody on the panel is just awesome. So thank you. Uh, so it, it just one thing about the, the post workflow that we had worked through and what we were doing with David way back when is making sure that you adopted the current workflow standard, which is just so key and critical. Don't make your own. I'm not sure if you have your own software, but I'll, I'll say don't make your own software. That's completely a new production pipeline and a new workflow that'll never be adopted. So what we were doing is working within the existing visual effects software packages. You had a fast render pipe. Everything was then distilled into 2D to do really fast comps. And then you would have the high ray trace when you go into everything. And it was all semi-automated, I should say. Uh, but if you work in that kind of modality, then you really are able to very easily translate between the traditional 2D world, the stereoscopic world, the volumetric, the holographic, it's just really making sure that you understand what is the viewpoint that you're starting with and then how do you view it? Because you really do need to be able to see this stuff uh, and not just edit or perform the, the, the post workflow blind. And to have a slightly less flip response, unless Todd, are you going to jump in? Uh, I'm trying to say something again here. Yo, uh, yeah. uh, so those uh, uh, stereoscopic and volumetric and other types of light fields or if you want to call them light fields uh, okay all day um, from my perspective are just um, methods of compression so you represent it in this way because that's uh, easy to handle okay so um, the only uncompressed thing is the raw light fields just whatever you capture for dimensional okay and you work with this now often you don't see how it compresses you don't have a way to make it three-dimensional because it's not explicitly Lambertian. There's this highlight in the eyes, uh, some sparkle somewhere, and you don't know. Maybe in some areas you can compress, uh, uh, you can store the full light field and compress everything else. But even in those areas, I believe that there are, we just have not found the way to compress because this is a very strong condition. It's a four-dimensional thing which satisfies one additional equation. And this equation, if we do it properly, should give us a chance to compress further. So maybe this remains to be um, discovered. Yeah, I can peel the curtain back a little bit more. We, we did do an uncompressed workflow at one point at, for one of our demos, which literally involved digital artists going through and touching up all of the raw images from every camera. I never want to do that again. But that's realistically what the uncompressed workflow is. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I, I think it's a matter of just compression. It's a matter of working with a format that is frankly tangible and easy to edit. Uh, a freeform piece of geometry is just easier to edit than trying to get at the each Im image is a light field and edit each individual camera. That's untenable. It's not cost effective. It's not how we think as human beings. Um, an artist. So it's going to, maybe there is a mythical editor out there that we have heretofore found. But if there is, it's a completely different way of thinking about uh, the artistic form. And that is even maybe a bigger challenge than any of the other things. We're doing. Well, and then no one's going to be able to know how to do it yet. But let me put my product hat on for a second and say the realistic path to market is uh, how, many, how many people who work in poster in the audience right now? Right. So the good news is the path to market for these holographic images is going to be working in an online, offline setting where you use existing tools, whether it's nonlinear editors and 2D color tools or 3D packages. And whatever decisions you make there will have to be then migrated back up in the light field before it gets published. And you won't really be looking at the light field in real time. That's the realistic path to market. We'll eventually get to native light field tools, but the way we get there is via existing tools. And David Stump, did you hear anything there that you disagree with since you're involved in the process? Uh, no, I agree. I think uh, uh, I agree with all of that. <clears throat> uh, basically, take the raw capture uh, data set and run it through. And in Nuke, we were able to build a system. We were able to build a system that did take one one of the images as a representation and affect all the other across the board. And we did get it down to the point where it was an economical and reasonably time efficient methodology for getting it all the way back out to 
what we were using as our, our display technology. There's definitely hope. That's great. Appreciate to have so much experience in the room. But before I let you go, I just wanted to throw the question around the table, one of those unfair ones. How many years from now do each of you think that we'll see light field displays and content being used for entertainment functions? And that means it could be at a movie theater, it could be at a theme park, it could be uh, on a mobile device or on the television at home. When will that happen? Brian, go first. Okay, wearing my pessimistic hat. <laughs> I think everything always takes 10 years. Uh, um, um, depends when you start counting. Uh, but, but look at all the great uh, technologies from talkies to, to uh, uh, you know, full motion, full animation, full uh, image, um, uh, cinematography with, with voice and lighting. That was about 10 years. It was 10 years for television. 10 years from what day though? Today or from uh, five years ago? That's a harder question. I don't know when, when we started, but let's say it was two or three years ago at least. Brian. January. Yeah. No, but seriously, if, if you're willing to admit six off headsets as light fields, which I'll, I'll grant is not popular on this panel, but, but, okay, motion induced light fields, January. And I just want to do a clarifying question. So when you say that, are you talking about first experiences? Are you talking about mass adoption? Like, what, what first experience. First experience? Well, he said January, so at least I didn't go on record saying it. Uh, <laughs> I think, and I, I've got obviously line of sight into some things that we're doing. Uh, you, you'll start seeing these things in not the distant future. In the near future, you're going to see these things. Come on. Well, you said January, so it's going to be sometime, you know, it, it, oh, I'm going to count on. Yeah, you didn't January. say January of what year? No. Yeah, that, that's funny. You didn't say a year. Uh, it, it's, it's not the, I just heard the stat on what is the, the OLED anniversary? Isn't it like 18? 20 something years now, 30 years. 40 years for LCD too. Yeah, some, some ridiculous number of decades that OLED has started until where you got into the consumer environment and some mass production, which is a scary, scary number. Uh, but in terms of okay. seeing the very first true holographic experience, it's within the next, let's say, between January and I'll call it three to five years then. Very good. If not sooner. Three to five what? Years. Okay. Days. Just okay. kidding. Just kidding. Sure. The ah. answer. Uh, we already see prototypes of good quality light field displays. Actually, we have one here. It is only too little, too small resolution. But the principle is there. Question? Well, the correction, the, the question clarification is commercially viable. Well, what, what I would argue is that commercial viability for something Disneyland buys to put in a ride is different than commercially viable to put into your home theater. So, so uh, for <laughs> very good. I think people will be making money with light fields starting in January. So for, and for, for commercial uh, commercial viable, it means we need to have commercial manufacturing of mass production, basically of those displays. Now, the, what I observe is that now there is a technology. There is those 10 micron pixels. There are smaller pixels. When one micron pixel becomes available, really good quality gigapixel displays will be available. And then the lenslets or holograms on top is just, um, they are available. They can be done. Okay, this so, was supposed to be the maybe, lightning round. Yeah. Come on. So, so maybe like five, <laughs> bring a buzzer. five years to big to five to, years to Thank reach the mass the mass market like iPhone or something. You're keeping these people from their pepperoni. <laughs> well, I'm going to answer four questions here. So I would say the first demonstration was ten years ago. So negative ten. <laughs> <clears throat> I think that you'll see commercial viability in five years for early adopters, maybe you know Universal Studios or Disney or or such things. I think you'll see in medical imaging, military, oil and gas, uh, uh, 10 years, sub 10 years. And I think you'll have in homes in 20. That means watching World Cup soccer in your home with all your friends on a single light field display in 20 years. Okay, we got so that all on. All displays will be light field displays. So we're gonna, we're gonna hold you to that. With that, I'd like to have you join me thanking our panels. Oh, David Stump AFC. Thank you all.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.